<laughs> Hello, everyone. Bienvenidos. Thank you for coming out to the Central Library today. Gracias a venir a Biblioteca Central. My name is Diane Olivo Posner, and I am the Principal Librarian Associate Director of the Exploration and Creativity Department here at the Los Angeles Public Library. And that's where you cheer. Woo! Uh, and I'm Kevin O'Kinney, also a librarian here in the Exploration and Creativity Department. And we're here to welcome you to today's, this afternoon's LA New Program, an afternoon of a Sada with Bricio Lopez and Javier Cabral. Because they can hear you. Now, before we, be, we begin, we'd like to take a moment to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind-the-scenes staff for helping bring the LA Made programs to you. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you would like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org forward slash events, E-V-E-N-T-S, and our LA Made programs visit lapl.org forward slash LA Made, L A M A D E. You nailed it. Uh, okay. <clears throat> We'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land, honor their elders past and present, as well as their descendants who are citizens of these nations. For more information on which territory you may reside on, check out native-land.ca. Uh, just a couple of other, other housekeeping tips. Uh, please silence your electronic devices so we don't uh, disturb our speakers today. Uh, take one moment to notice the exit signs, just in case. Uh, if you parked in the garage underneath the library today, you can get your parking ticket validated at the information desk in the main lobby, and the parking will only be $1 as long as you parked after 1 and leave before 5. Woo, a dollar. Yeah. Uh, and please, no eating or drinking unless it's bottled water because it's so hot. And the bathrooms are down the hallway and to your right. And there is a drinking fountain there, too. So, yeah. yes, please hydrate on these hot days. And now for today's amazing program, an afternoon of Asada with Bricia and Javi. Join authors Bricia Lopez from Galaguetza and Javier Cabral from LA Taco for an engaging afternoon discussion about all things carne asada culture, from choosing the right marinade to the right art of using an onion to clean your grill. Their new cookbook, Celebrating the Art of Hosting and Cooking Backyard Asada Cookout, is the first cookbook in the country to be written about this subject. Moderating this panel will be the amazing Patty Rodriguez, co-founder of the bilingual Little Libros Children's Books. We are, yes, Yay. yeah, Patty. We didn't talk for all of them. Little Libros. We also wanted to let you know that we'll be giving away copies of Asada, so please keep your wristbands that you'll have the bright green this time. Keep them on as they have numbers on them and we'll be announcing the winners after the program. Lastly, uh, after the program, there will be samples of asada for people to try. Mm, so excited. And copies of the books will be available to purchase and have signed as well. Uh, we partnered with one of our local bookstores. And also we found out the library store will be selling the asada books that are signed to later. Well, um, opportunities to get asada. Right. And of course, you can check them out too, because yeah. we're a library. <laughs> okay, now let's now welcome to our LA Made stage, Bricia, Javier, and Patty. Woo! Oh. Hey, be careful. <laughs> right. Hello, everyone. You did like some welcome music. Welcome. I should, put it on my, I should have put it on my, um, on my phone. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thanks for being here. Yeah. On, on a, a Sunday. Uh, Buenas tardes. Feliz Domingo. Happy Sunday. I'm Patty Rodriguez, and I am delighted to be here with two of my friends, uh, Bricia and Javier, to celebrate Asada, the art of Mexico, Mexican style grilling, a beautiful cookbook that celebrates the Mexican-American experience, um, something that I've grown up as a Mexican-American. 
So thank you so much for even inviting me here today. I mean, I couldn't think of a better person to represent LA, right? <laughs> I feel like we wrote this book for you. And every time when I, when I was writing it, I would think, what would Patty think right now? So definitely channel my inner Patty Rodriguez writing this book for sure. I loved everything about this book. And it's about time there's a book that celebrates the art of the carne asada because it did not exist before this. No, which is crazy. Yeah, I can't, I can't believe it either. I mean, after covering tacos for, what, 18 years, I was like, what, no one's, no one's written an actual book on asada? Wild. But here we are. I always say that this generation of Latino Americans, Mexican Americans, we're chosen by the universe to really share our stories and it's our time to do it and we're here right now and so it's a blessing to be here with all of you celebrating our culture and our traditions. So let's start from the very, very beginning. This is your second cookbook that you both work together. Yes. So talk to me about the inspiration behind Masada and how the idea came about. Yeah, uh, it was... Uh, well, kind of the idea came in 2020. Uh, I love hosting for the July Asadas. It's like I love hosting people over in my house. We've you've come to a few of my for the July Asadas, and I couldn't do it that year. My brother wanted to. I mean, my siblings each wanted to. You know, kind of they were going to be home doing them by themselves. My brother, um, they asked him to do a photo shoot with him. So he asked me for the recipes. He's like, I really want to do the food that you always do. How do you do this? So I sent him the recipes that I had created. And as soon as I saw the photos that came out of that asada that he made, I was like, oh my gosh, this needs to be a book. I'm like, this is the book I want to write. Also at the same time, in 2019, my siblings and I were going to open a restaurant um, all focused on Mexican meats and Oaxacan meats and like the, the idea of carne asada celebration. Yeah. We were so close to signing the lease, that restaurant never came to be, but I channeled all that love and energy and I put it into a book, which is what this is. I called Javi and I was like, this is the book we're gonna do next. And he's like, okay. Um, and yeah, I kidnapped him for a day and then we wrote the proposal in like a few hours yeah, and then it was done. And, and how is it to collaborate <laughs> together on a, on a cookbook? Um, you know, you're, this is, he said, your baby, and Javier, you come on board. Like, how do you kind of like, where do you draw the line, Javi, on your opinion and, you know, where you move the recipe forward? Well, first of all, I really want to thank everyone for being here. It means a lot um, because, you know, if you're, you're here for a cookbook, you're here for Asada, you're, you read. Thank you. Just, just because I'm on the other side of the screen and I see uh, people not reading these days, so thank you for being here reading. <laughs> Um, especially as a writer, um, but to answer your question, um, yeah, the, 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 the co-writing process, it really does require a lot of trust. It requires a lot of um, just like, I mean, getting into the Bidisa's brain um, and uh, just... It's a difficult task in its own. <laughs> you do such a wonderful job in understanding her. It's almost like you can read her mind. Like, I, I, because he of, can actually read my mind, which is amazing. Right? I it's the best thing in the world when somebody can read your mind. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's, inter you know, it's, it's, it's the art of the interview in a long form way. Um, really like, you know, uh, you know, a lot of us, we take for granted, like the things that we do, um, in our families with our friends culturally, because we just accept them for who they are. But when we talk to people like, Oh, like, Oh, you, you want to come to that salon? They're like, what's that? You know, if, if you didn't, if they didn't grow up in LA, if they didn't grow up, um, you know, Mexican American. Um, so, you know, when you're writing something, especially something like this, you know, you, you always, as a writer, you have in mind, um, you know, the other person who's reading it, what are they going to get out of it? Um, and what are they going to, like, how can they use it? So it's a fine, it's a, it's a balance of inserting, you know, personality um, and uh, stories, right? Like, like personal stories and experiences, memories, uh, imagery, um, smells, sounds, um, and, you know, yes, again, taste. And uh, yeah, and just what would Brisa write? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's also, I mean, when he says like a long interview, so really like the words there, I would say they're, they're my words, but they put it in, in his hand. So the way that it works, he's in my home, we're talking and he has his you voice. Kidnap him. I can't do kidnap him. That will go into that, but I do. I'm like, I don't allow him to leave. Um, and he has his voice note app open yep. and then we just talk and converse and, um, 
And then he's like typing. He's like, wait, hold on. What did you say? And I'm like, I don't know. We're just, I'm just flowing, OK? I just keep going. So like, and then, um, but I wrote a little bit. And then like, I'll send him like, here's what I want. Here's like this, the gist of what I want to say. And then he'll edit my, he'll edit it. And then when it comes to recipes, they're all my recipes. And he does the fun work of like, one pound equals 2.2 kilograms or yeah, something. Everything, or two, you know, everything, whatever. Yeah, every single recipe is converted, um, you know, to, so he does to metric. Part. You know, it's, everything's grams, and which is huge pain in the butt. Because uh, we're not taught that in school, right? It's all pounds and. Not, it's, we're the only country that yeah, we don't do that. Everything's. And it's always like, okay, she wrote like yeah. she put the salt before, you know, like she put the she like listed the onions before the peppers and the pepper should go first. So those little things, he edits all those things. So I just write the recipes out um, in very plain form, and he goes back and edits them really nicely so y'all can have a nice guy. Yeah, I feel, you know, some of the writers that I look up to, like, you know, the, I feel like a great writer or a great, you know, something that you're reading, uh, you know, it's just to be able to write the way someone talks. But, you know, in this day and age, in this generation, you know, it has to be always conversational, but it always has to always have, you know, show off a little finesse um, with writing, too. Um, keep everything as con short and sweet as possible, because like I was saying earlier, um, not many people read beyond the headline these days. So, um, you know, always think of the attention span of the other person uh, who's reading it, because, you know, the brain's always... Mm -hmm. I also want to say I have a huge admiration for Javier's palate and a huge admiration for his knowledge for food, and I do try really hard to impress him. So he did eat all my food that I cooked for the book, and I was just like, sit there, just be like, Okay, I'm gonna wait for like the eyes to like, and the nod. And, like if I didn't get that, I knew it wasn't good enough. So then I'd go back. Um, but I trust his palate, and I I really take his criticism to heart, and I really really respect his knowledge in food. He, I he this man can eat, and this man can, has incredible food memory. So I really respect that, and being able to kind of share and and him, and you know and also so he I, when I know that I want something. No matter how hard he tries to talk me out of it, like here he knows that he's not going to win the fight. <laughs> but there's some fights that he was like trying to win in this book. I was like, that's not going to happen. But thanks for your opinion. You know, but it's you know, it's it's a mutual thing too. Yeah, I'm also going to be for I don't know. I mean, since before I was before I could legally drink. Yeah. Um. So her and I go way back. So you know, I'm just like sister to me. Signal over there. Yeah. yeah. I grew up eating. Uh, attending, eating, creating asadas. It's part of my blood. And I know a lot of you here maybe don't even know what an asada is. So let's talk about that. Because I'm walking in and I'm like, I'm thinking, it's just part of my DNA. Like, it, it, I feel like everyone knows what an asada is, but the reality is that not everyone does. So what's an asada? Yeah, I realize that too, traveling the country, promoting this book, I realize not everybody knows what an asada is. And my girlfriend who lives in Atlanta put it the simplest, the simplest, way possible that I'm like, I can't believe it took me this long to realize this. Because I was trying to explain to her, and she's like, so you mean it's like a barbecue when you can go to a barbecue, but you can eat barbecue? I was like, yes, this girl, exactly like that. Only that when you go to this barbecue, it's like a little crazier because it's all a bunch of like a big family and there's music and there's frijoles and beans and meat and shrimp and ceviche and like it starts at 2 p.m. and ends at 2 in the morning and it just becomes comes this big old party and it's almost like someone always thinks it's someone's birthday but like it's not and like why are you guys here and why is there a cake i don't know so it's, like, it's, it's just there so like i think that's where nasada is yeah and it's always it's also it's also like a, a very human like if you're if someone invited to an asada to their asada that means that you know you're you're slowly you're becoming family or they're, they're seeing you as like a, as like someone that they want to be around and spend time with and share their food with energy with and uh, you know that, that we during writing this book um, we saw like the the term like you know whoever whoever is invited to the asada right um, because you know like, like and some kind of celebrity or something like that did something funny or something or something cool um so like it, it, like the term asada almost also exists in like a very like a uh, metaphorical place like it's a it's a metaphorical kind of gathering that you like you're invited to the asada uh, you're come and be one of us you're now family and you're we trust you in to our world and it's, also, it's, it's a very intimate experience as well right i know there's music and there's you know it could be between four people to a hundred in an asada but it's but it's intimate like you know everybody in some sense 
ends. Um, most of the asada that I grew up uh, being part of or my family putting together were at the park um, in East LA. So what is it about the park that is a safe space for immigrant families? Well, it's the backyard that they need, right? I mean, I grew up in an, in an apartment, you know, and that's what happens in LA. Your immigrant family, you share three families, share a two bedroom, one bathroom. That's just what happens. So what do you do in the weekends? You get out and you want to have an asada and where do you have it? It's at the park. Um, in the book, if you go through the photos, you'll see that that was really depicted the first day of our shoot. We, in mo I mean, I would say 80% of the other pictures in the book are all real. Nothing was pretend, nothing is fake light. Nothing is lit in fake lighting. And um, for those of you who know photography, um, understand magazine foot photography and a lot of cookbook photography has a lot of light. I've been in many cookbook settings and shoots and there's a lot of people. My photographer just came with a bag. <laughs> and all we had was the sun and it was all naturally lit. Uh, and we went to the park up the street from my house. I had my mom there, my dad there, my kids, my siblings, friends, and um, my brother married into a big, beautiful family. So, you know, my their, um, his extended family. And we just got down with food and my photographer was there to capture everything. And I think those are probably my favorite pictures of the book. Um, and then the last day of the shoot, I hosted an asada in my home where I had all my girlfriends and friends. You were there, uh, Patty, Javi, of course. And I just told everybody, you know, it's my last day of shooting my book and I just want to celebrate like I'm finally done with this thing. I just want to just eat, feed you all, taste the recipes and like hopefully you like them. And, it was so beautiful. And I have some friends that are DJs. They just came, they brought their setup. And it's, it was just like a beautiful party um, that is also, and all my friends are in the book. So I think like that was the essence of what it was. It doesn't have to be precious or pretentious. It was just real LA people having fun in the sun because, you know, it's the best city in the world. Yeah, and, and great minds think alike, Patty, because I, it's funny that you asked that question because yeah, that's no matter where you are in LA County, um, or even Southern California, um, you know, it's mostly, it's only or mostly people of color that use LA screen spaces. And this is a phenomenon that like, I mean, I, you know, there's, I'm sure there's a, a, a really good reason for it. And I actually recently um, hired um, James Rojas, who's a really, really good um, urban, uh, just like an urban uh, a designer. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, he's like a really good writer and, and he's writing a story on his on LA Tacos soon, like why people of color in LA. Um, you know, to celebrate everything and, and parks and the green spaces, including asadas. I mean, th that's what I remember. And um, to me, those are the fondest mom moments. You know, we would carry the the big Tupperwares and um, the the made the frijol the frijoles de la olla, and then my tia will have a whole, you know, uh, el arroz listo, and then like the, my 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 dad and my tios will be in the mm -hmm. in the park grill and the piñata on the tree and just mm -hmm. kids running around like jumper. jump, maybe a jumper. <laughs> Always um, a jumper, come on. And then like, I remember my dad would have to wake up early to grab a table. You know, like you have to get like throat. a good table on like with a big tree so you can get a good shade. Apparently now you can call and reserve. No idea you could do that, but yeah, you can do Oh, that. you can do that now? Oh, good. I think Great. you could always do it, but I just Maybe feel like we, we needed to know. know. Yeah. No. My dad ain't calling, no, ain't calling yeah. the city. We're not going to internet to reserve a table, <laughs> no. We're no. Not do that. But let's talk about the food. Um, what do you consider the key elements of a successful carne asada and how does it compare to other grilling traditions, like the barbecue, the hamburger and hot dogs? I mean, there's a lot more flavor in masada, that's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> that's the biggest difference. There's a lot more lime, lemon, and salt in our asada, 100%. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you can go as big or as small as you want. You know, um, you can you know have like a, a, a weeknight personal asada, which just kind of have like salsa, Green onion, like grilled green onions, um, carne, of course, and some good tortillas and guacamole. That's the essential essentials. Or, like in our in Brisa's super lavish asadas that were, that, that she would throw for uh, for the cookbook and to celebrate it. It's just like it could be, I mean, half the book, you know. Um, yeah, I cooked a lot, so I I love welcoming my guests with ceviche always. I think that's always a great call. 
Um, you can throw it, you know, you can put it together super fast. Um, it doesn't get everyone full, but it gives you a little nibble. I love having chicharrón, cheese, some escabeche, something to pick on, salsas, guacamole. And that allows you to have your guests sort of, you know, just eat a little bit without getting so full. Meat, chicken, fish on the grill all the time because you want to make sure that everyone that doesn't eat one or the other can have something. Um, if I'm having a big asada, I'll have at least two rice, two types of rice, whether it's red, green, or white, but one of those three will be always be there. At least two types of beans, um, de la olla, puercos, refritos. Um, I like to have two options. Uh, in salsa, that's kind of where I go crazy, where I just do the most because that's really where the flavor comes and how you can really just, you really know that everyone's gonna get a different experience out of your out of your spread if you have at least three to five salsas because everyone can recreate their own dishes and every bite will be different. And then for vegetables, of course, you have to have nopales, you have to have green onions, um, cebollitas, spring onions is really what I love to serve instead of the scallions or green onions. Um, and, I mean, yeah, you can have a Caesar salad. I always kind of go light on the salad. But uh, my Caesar salad does go very fast. And even just marinated grill, um, grilled radishes, I think, is great also just for that, like, just bite of. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think one, one of, like, the, this, the, one of the. And then you got to have flour and corn turkey. I don't know if it's a this, but the, the, I think. And one of the most, one of the most, like I think, like the most impressive things in the cookbook is like the concept of like a, 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 a chicharron and cheese board, um, you know. And the inspiration for that was obviously from you know your her, her, her father and her mother who who always welcomed us out with that in Oaxaca. But it's kind of like you know a, like a, a charcuterie board feels out of place at a canasada. Yeah, don't do a charcuterie. Board. Don't do charcuterie boards, you know. You gotta you gotta you gotta decolonize and uh, <laughs> and go. To, uh, Expand your horizons. With chicharron. Right? The cheese and chicharron board is kind of like a, a twist, yeah. our own variation, right, of yeah. what that is. Yeah. What that like is. Much I say welcome board, I would say. It's a welcome, a welcome board. board. It's a welcome snack. Um, you know, you have all the beautiful fajitas, chicharron, and you can have, like, you can have even vegetarian chicharron. It may not be gluten-free, but, you the, you know, those little puffs. Oh, yeah. You, you have. Uh, and, the, and there's even, like, the Camino chicharron now that they sell at, like, uh, you know, Northgate. And, like, yeah, uh, at, like, you have so like, many different like, chicharrones. It's, it's a huge sheet that's, like, like, this big, and you kind of break it off. And instead, oh, of break, so good. instead of breaking bread, you break chicharron with people, you know? Yeah. And then you've probably seen the videos on TikTok and Instagram of, like, the folks just getting the big chicharron and then dipping it in the re uh, already made guacamole from North yeah Mallorca, yeah so you have guacamole chicharron mexican cheeses are phenomenal um salvadoran cremas it's like my favorite i don't have any salvas in the house but thank you for the crema thank you um that's the only crema you always find in my house like no need for mexican crema once you find salvadoran crema um and yeah, salsas and then escabeche, which is beautiful, just pickled vegetables, and which you also find in other boards. So it's just the fat, the creaminess, the saltiness, the spice, the the citrus, like the acid from from the from the escabeches, all those things. You can just sit there and pick on that all the time, and then you can always go back with it, right? Like when I make, and then seeing everyone make their own plate, their own taco, their own bite, where you know those who know, like, will get like all like a a nice taco and then they'll go back to the board and then they'll grab chicharron and then they'll sprinkle chicharron on top for the extra crunch, it's delicious. You can tell a lot about a person's personality with how they how they serve themselves. Oh yeah, 100%. When I, this is one of the shots that I like the most about the book. You can see so many different types of people putting their plate together and I love those photos from the book because different friends are just different. It, everyone has a different experience and it's not about me mm -hmm prepping a bite for you. Like, I shouldn't tell you how you should eat this. I mean, I know that when you go to a restaurant, it's a different experience, right? When, when a chef cooks for you and they're very intentional about how they plate the dish and they're like, this is how chef would like you to eat it and, and enjoy it. And I'm like, great, like, okay. There's something wonderful about that because like, I don't have to think and perfect, it's great. This is exactly how chef wanted me to have it. When an estada, there's nothing like that. It's just do your own and I trust that whatever combination you can have here, you are going to just get a tortilla and meat and call it a date, that's fine, it'll be amazing. Or go as crazy as you want, but it's about really you creating your own experience in the bite.
I, the way I eat my asada or my plate, and it's something that my, I saw my family do is, I wouldn't make a taco from the tortilla. Instead, I will tear a piece from the tortilla and use the tortilla as like the scooper. Mm -hmm. And I, that's how I eat my food, like 95% of the time. And I remember the first time I stepped out of that element and I was at a restaurant with people that did not look like me and I did that and I felt so ashamed. Like I was so embarrassed because I was like, wait, people don't eat like this. They put their tortilla out and then they make a taco. I'm like, wait a minute, am I doing this wrong? But um, there's no right or wrong way, right? And, and I feel like this book celebrates, I think, the way that we all kind of grew up eating Mexican food. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you both, what, is, what was the relationship you had growing up with Mexican food? I know your parents, um, they own a restaurant, and now you and your siblings um, are, are owners. But what, was food, what did Mexican food mean to you growing up? Mm, well, Mexican food to me was just known as Oaxacan food to me, or just food in general. I grew up in Oaxaca. I moved to L.A. when I was 10. L.A. was the first time where I ever had a flour tortilla in my life, I think, and a burrito. Like, I went to I, my dad took me to Chabelitas off of Vermont? Western. 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 My mom's like, Western. <laughs> and I remember him being like, you ready for this? And I was like, yes, give me, give me all. And I remember eating it for the first time, and I was like, what is this? Like, what, what? I was just like, oh, my God, it was delicious. So for me, just kind of like Mexican food to me has just been like part one, which is all Oaxaca and open fire cooking and chiles and memelas and corn every single day of my life. But like the most amazing corn, my, smelling my grandma's hair that smelled like burnt chiles and like smoke. Like my grandma stayed smelling like smoke. And now I think my kids are going to grow up thinking that I start smelling, like I stay smelling like smoke too, which makes me kind of happy, like kind of. Um, and, and just like the most amazing things you can think. My mom, who's right here and second in the audience, give a round of applause. Like this woman, I would come home and she'd have a home cooked meal for us every single day. And now a fresca every single day. She'd have like a three course dinner for us every single day. So I just grew up eating the most incredible food ever. And then part two of my life, like after 10, was just El Taurino, Chabelitas, you know, you know, you know what? Even Taco Bell, shout out Taco Bell too, you know, oh, like let's, let's be real here. Like crispy yeah. taco, Tito's tacos. My God, like out in like, like out in like you know, sent, like on the West Side, like I've never had that. So like that yellow cheese, like I can't eat it anymore because you know I'm like a grown woman now. But like before, <laughs> I was like, wow, like just dip it in like that, like salsa that had like zero flavor, but even like even real cheese. But but like even just that, like the crispy taco with like this like weird meat, I guess, and then like this salsa with like no flavor, but like somehow it did. I was like, how is, um, why am I still eating this? So like that, that kind of has a special food memory place in my, in my, in my life just because I didn't have that. And like, I was the first time that I, I kind of had that food for the first time, you know, as, as, as a grown up, I guess, you know, as a teenager. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's just, I would say, like, two parts of my life. So for me, Mexican food, you know, I, I think comes twofold. It's it's the Oaxaca of me and then always having that, too. And I was very blessed to grow up in a restaurant that really has the best Oaxacan food in the country. And, like, being able... Yes. Thank you. Come on, clap for me. Thank you. Uh, so, and just being spoiled of, like, having great, amazing food, but also, like, being okay with having, like, not so healthy and you know, low-key crappy food that, like, still sparks food memories in my brain. Like, I, I, I feel really blessed to be able to have both. And Javi? Oh, man, mine is, like, the total opposite of that. Um, I kind of grew up with that, you know, with that, with that dicho, with the saying is, like, que siempre frijoles en la casa. Mm -hmm. So I actually didn't like to go eat out to eat Mexican food um, at all because I was just, like, you know, you can eat that stuff at home. Um, you know, my mom would cook. and um, But I kind of, that can't, that kind of, I kind of, it was. It took a long time for me to kind of realize that, you know, like kind of like the inner, the inner kind of self racism involved with food that I had to unpack. And I actually wrote a story on it for uh, Bon Appetit because uh, it was called uh, "Why It Took a White Chef to Make Me Love Mexican Food." Because I would, I grew up watching uh, Rick Bayless on public access on uh, on on public on like the public channels because I didn't have cable. And uh, and I was like, oh crap, you know, you can have like platanos with eggs and like you can like you got dance style. So 
it took a long time for me to kind of realize that like, you no, know, like I actually come, like my family comes from like the best damn food region in the world and like the tastiest and- um, What, your family's from Oaxaca? I mean- <laughs> I didn't know you were Oaxaca. It's still Mexico, right? It's still Mexico. Um, but it's yeah. Like a thing we have. yeah, yeah. Well, you know, when you ask someone from Oaxaca, from Oaxaca where they're from, they're always gonna say Oaxaca first, not Mexico, um, right? Yeah. So, um, but yeah. So my, you know, my it was mine was a little bit more of a, a of like a long kind of a way of like processing and you know just going to therapy and just being like, okay, like you know, no, Mexican food's freaking, it's it's the best. And I think that's the thing. I think again, like I mentioned at the top of the show here, that this generation, I feel that we have rejected assimilation um, more so than past generations. Um, in doing research for something that I was working on, I came across books uh, written in the, in the first half of the, um, of the century where they were teaching teachers how to help um, immigrant children assimilate in the US and in some of those writings, they talked about how to influence the children to reject the food at home. And I think for many years, that still lingered all up until even like, I think we're kind of still fighting that. Um, and I, me growing up, I, there was this, I comida en la casa. Yeah. I hated when my mom would say that to us because I wanted McDonald's. Yeah. I wanted the cheeseburger and the fries and the Barbie toy that came with the Happy Meal. But my mom was like, hay frijoles en la casa, hay comida en la casa. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take, it took me years. And now I'm proud to say that now that I'm a mother to two kids, I'm proud to say that to my kids. Like, we're not going to go there because there's food at home. But I, I hated beans with a passion. Like, I just hated because there was always freaking beans at home. Frijoles de la olla. And I want to talk about frijoles de la olla in this book. Because these are the best frijoles de la olla <laughs> that I even called my mom. And I told her, mom, your frijoles de la olla just got beat by Bricia's frijoles yeah. de la olla. <laughs> no, by yours. Here's the thing. If they're not mine. They're yours. And when you make these recipes, they're your recipes. Because, yes, I wrote a guideline. But at the end of the day, is your love that went in there, your seasoning went in there. I, it's your seasoning. It's you know, the way that you cut. There's a way that you even choose the beans is the way of how much water you put in there and yes there's a guideline these is these are guidelines they're called recipes but in reality they're guidelines and it really it's not mine they're yours you just happen to find someone that like gave you an actual like wording and i think that's what i've realized with a lot of women who tell me these things too um when i'm when i'm doing these events they're like oh my gosh like Thank you because like I really wanted to learn this recipe and it was so hard for like for me to get this from my tia or my cousin or my mom because you know it's really hard. It is hard. I mean my mom, mom's gone so okay, I can finally say this stuff. I'm just um, when I was writing Oaxaca, I also sequestered her and I you know I have a strong personality so I would just be like okay stop right there and I would just it took we wrote the like the Oaxaca book. I was with her for like over a month and I would just write every single thing down and I would then cook it myself until it finally was something. But I mean, it was a lot of work. So for me to give you a book, a guideline that you're already familiar with, that you've seen your mom do a bunch of times, but watching, I, I had to learn how to cook by watching and it's really, really difficult. You have to get in the kitchen and redo, some, and redo it over and over again. So these are just guidelines to recipes that you've seen the women in your family done so many times. But it's also going back to assimilation because when I told my mom the ingredients to your frijoles de la olla, she said, that's how your grandma made them in Mexico. And I don't, and you have to pick up the book to get the, the recipe, but it goes back to assimilation because this recipe requires manteca, lard. And for many years, manteca, lard, was seen here in this country as unhealthy. But it's actually the, the other way around. So my mom had to stop. Fat if you want to be fancy yeah. about it. But my yeah. mom had to. My mom and my tias had to stop cooking with manteca, because here it was seen as unhealthy. You were shamed for picking up that bucket of lard. You remember that bucket of lard back in the eighties? It was like white with the red lid. Oh, remember here that? in the eighties. <laughs> from Farmer John, or I think it was Farmer John, right? Um, but it's actually not unhealthy for you. 
but again, your uh, many of our parents have to let go of some of the cultures and traditions to be able to fit in this country. And I think in a way that is what's heartbreaking. However, you, Javi, you guys are working to change that. So how do you bring the love for food into a world that's sort of expecting you to not bring your full self to be able to make it in this country? That's a great question. Um, I think, uh, like, I think it, it, it goes back to like, okay, you're writing a cookbook. Um, what's the purpose of the cookbook? To get people to cook. Um, so you have to just strip away a lot. You know, it's 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 a it's a form of service. It's like a, a it's like a, a public service. Uh, a cookbook is is an act of like you know getting people to cook. So always think of like what you have to strip everything out. You have to get rid of your ego and just you know kind of show don't tell with the recipes and with the and with the food. And that's a it's that's the kind of like my best answer for that because it is kind of like it's an evolving. Um, you know, answer. Yeah. Um, well, I think this is a whole. I just this is really a, a different part of me that I learned to to know. This book actually gave me more than I thought I could ever receive. Like the moment I decided to write this book, it was like I started to know a part of me I didn't know existed. Forever, I thought I was only, you know, a girl from Oaxaca that was only allowed to cook Oaxacan food, and I needed to be this person and needed to dress a certain way. I needed to be this, I needed to be one thing because that's what the world expected of me. I was, you know, I was, came to the LA when I was 10 and I held this Oaxacan flag and my family and I need to preserve my culture and that's all I can do. But then I realized that I don't have to be anything the world expects me to be. I can be whoever the, whoever I want to be. And I love LA and this city has given me so much. So, Writing this book, I just it was like this freeing moment of, I can be anything, I can cook anything, and I'm a creative. And I mean, people who cook for a living, people who are chefs, I, I, don't, I'm, well, I don't wanna say this, but like, people who are chefs who cook for you, who run restaurants, who are there, they're crazy artists. They are people, it's really, really difficult to execute great food. So for someone to tell me, you can't cook that. It's like it's like somebody telling somebody else you can't paint with the someone who's an artist and say, well, you can't paint with the with the color blue because that's only reserved for, you know, the blue people and the yellow people can only cook with the yellow paintbrush and you can't do that. So for me, it was like very freeing and being like, I can cook anything I want to cook, and I sort of started in this part of my life where I thought. I want to just represent LA and what I know. I grew up in LA. I've been here for 20 plus years. And, you know, I think we had a conversation about, well, I don't know if we can write this book in Asada because I'm not from the north of Mexico. Like, uh, that's, where, that's where Asada comes from, from, you know, Sonora and flour tortillas. I'm like, yeah, I'm not from Sonora, but I grew up in LA. Like, I know this food. I know what it's supposed to taste like. I'm really confident in, like, the way things are. So I just went for it. And... I never set out to write a book about Sonora Asada cooking. Mm. I set out to write a book about my LA experience, yeah. my LA life, who I am. And yes, I am from Oaxaca, but I can also be something else. So I think there was a moment when I realized that I can be anything I want to be and I don't have to be pigeonholed to one thing and I can be both from LA and both from Oaxaca. And I think that's what this book gave me. And you can do anything and like you don't have to be anything the world expects you to be. You can just live your life and enjoy. And at the end of the day, it's just about, I'm feeding people, you know? It's it's a beautiful thing when you feed people. Yeah, I got to, I got to uh, you know, travel all through Sonora and, and Nor Monterrey and, uh, and all like the north of Mexico for, and all scouting for Netflix for the, for the, my, for the Talk Chronicles, for the Taco Chronicles, Las Cronicas del Taco. And uh, I, like, Asada is a damn religion there, like 100%, like it's, it's insane. It's like the obsession that people have with asada there. Um, asada in Mexico is a lot. It's very different from like LA style asada. One, it's then the main. It's, so it's it's an extreme. It's like it's a lot more uh, minimalist and simple. Um, there's not really much marinades. Um, it's just salt and high quality like local beef that people like. In, for example, if you go to Ed if you go to Hermosillo, Sonora, there's they don't have like a, a carniceria. They have meat boutiques and people are loyal to farms there. Um, so that's all. And we do. 
I told Lisa, like, yeah, you know, like, if we're going to write this book, you know, we're going to, we also have to give props to that, you know, because it's Mexican-American, but it's still Mexican. Um, so we do have a recipe in the book that acknowledges, you know, all the contributions, and, and that's style of asada, too. So we do honor them um, and honor the northern Mexican style of asada, just because I, I go there a lot. And people and the and the, and the Norteños are always like, "Hey, wait!" And and you wrote a book on asada, on asada. Yeah, and I was I like, "Yeah." Thing, like, I was like, also, I heard I also learned this new word that Mex we're not a monolith, which means all Mexicans are the same. I just learned this <laughs> in Portland, but we're not the same, right? What? Well, we're not. Said that. We're, Someone we're said not. that to me. That was like, I'm gonna use that word next time in the panel. We're so not here a monolith. We're not a monolith. So um, w we're all different. Like, like. I'm from Oaxaca, <laughs> you're from, you're from Zacatecas, like, we're all different, like, I'm like, I'm not pretending to anything, but we're also very unique, so this is my, my experience in my life, and I, that is one of the things where we say how the co-writing process works, because Javi's like, we need to travel to the north of Mexico, and we need to take this very serious, I'm like, boy, I am not going to do that, I am writing a book on yeah, L.A. Asada, like, and that's what this book is, I like, can't pretend to be anything else, I, uh, th the minute I went through it, I was like, this is Los Angeles, this is exactly what a carne asada in our backyard, in, this, in the first floor of your garage in your apartment, um, of, at the park. This is exactly what it is. And it just took me back to all those moments. And that's what makes it so beautiful because you guys did such a wonderful, wonderful job. And it's just so incredible to know that you are helping elevate Mexican cuisine because it is one of the most wonderful cuisines on earth. And there's a misconception mm -hmm. that Mexican food is not healthy. Mm -hmm. um, one, I think we can all guess where it comes from, assimilation. And, 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 but two, like, what are you both doing to change that narrative about Mexican food being unhealthy? Because it's far from being unhealthy. I mean, I have two books. I have a restaurant. <laughs> I, mean, I just feel like that's all my life. Like, my life's work has been surrounding Mexican food and perception of Mexican food even from the value that we preserve it. I, I think that also it starts with this generation just really being okay with being Mexican American and learning like their value. And I, I love, you know, I think about, you know, my, my own children, my daughter who's three years old, my son who's eight years old and how amazing it's gonna be for them to grow up with that as being normal, you know? Mm -hmm. You just, I mean, I grew up, knowing my food was healthy. Like in Oaxaca, I, I never thought my food was not. I think it was only when I came to the U.S. that I started hearing these things. Like, I'm like, what? But that's just because the way that it was prepared here and it was prepared by different people. I don't, I, it was, I don't know. But I think the, the word that I, the work that I do and the work that I see a lot of chefs doing today, um, both Mexican and non-Mexican chefs regarding Mexican food is just really respecting it, respecting the craft, using great quality ingredients, and introducing flavors to the world and introducing traditions to the world. And that's, I think that's, I mean, that's what I do for a living every single day and what I continue to do and the message that I want to get across to my daughter and to my son. And, you know, my, you know, my son sometimes says, Mom, I know we, I know we come from the place with the best food in the world, but like sometimes I want to eat something else, you know? But like the fact that he says that in itself, I think it's just like such a win for this generation and, you know, for little, and, and I'm not kidding when I said like I was writing this book and I was like, this book was going to mean for, for like the patties of the world because we are, you know, our generation, Patty, you, you're our generation is just like just learning to love and accept themselves. And I, I'm sometimes I'm like, I wish I would have, wish I would have thought like this when I was like 15. Like, I really wish I did. But it, it's fine, because I know that the 15-year-olds now are. And it's beautiful to see. And me being able to be me today is to inspire those 15-year-olds and those 13-year-olds so they have that experience that I'm only having, in, you know, in my 30s. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's, you know, Mexican food, Mexican cuisine, Mexican-American, you know, it, it, has, it has, like, a very unique, like, issue that, very little, like other cuisines that I know of, um, or that you know I've read about, or have tried has against it, and it has like a unique like double edge, like a double standard to it. Um, you know, one of my great, one of like I wrote a I wrote a, a, a story maybe like seven years now, and it was like in defense of the five dollar taco, and you know uh, West Avila, who's a great taquero here in, in LA, he gave me a great example. He was like, bro, if I put like four beautiful like diver scallops on a plate, and I can charge like thirty bucks for that, 
But if I put those same four diver scallops on two tortillas and charge 30 bucks for that, people will trip out and get you know, upset. So it really is a matter of you know, having these tough conversations and letting people know that like, no, Mexican food isn't, isn't just like, you know, I, I know you love Taco Bell, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's not that around no, the world. I said I, no, no, I'm just kidding. Oh, I'm, no, just kidding. I'm, I'm just younger. Kidding. I'm not saying I'm, I'm going kidding. there right now. No, no, but it's like, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's like, I think, I think uh, you know, we're seeing now the rise of like region, uh, of regionality now in Mexican restaurants in the U.S. So, you know, it's not just like a taqueria now, but now it's like a Tijia style taqueria or like, you know, Sonoran style taqueria or like, you know, or, you know, Oaxacan restaurants. And so I think that, you know, it's going to be a matter of having these conversations and educating uh, people uh, and also just letting people know, like, hey, you can go to Mexico and like experience this yourself too. It's like, you know, so, so far from God, but so close to the U.S. Um, so that's kind of like, a, you know, uh, that's kind of like a... a there's kind of there's a lot of racism and kind of systemic stuff that you have to deal with, but it, but trip but trip out think about it like it, people around the world like it, it's if you're like in a Mexican restaurant in like Tokyo or something right you go in and like what kind of food is it it's gonna be like Tex-Mex so somehow like Tex-Mex um, you know that kind of cheesy kind of rich things kind of became Mexican food for a lot of people around the world you know and that's now just now starting to change because you know more people are like loving Mexico City now and they and they want to go try and they go to like a Marisco's restaurant there and. And they oh so you, so you can so you mean that Mexican Mexican food can be like really refreshing and light, and you know not you know heavy for you. So it's I think uh, it's just with the rise of regionality in Mexican food, I think hopefully we'll start to see more people know understanding that yeah that Mexican food isn't isn't bad for you. <laughs> We're running out of time, and I have a ton of questions, but um, we want to make room for questions that you all may have. So last question: Let's talk about tortillas. Flour or corn? Oof. No. <laughs> it's a, a million-dollar question. Well, I mean, listen, I, of course, it's going to be corn for me. I, that's, like, in my, like, my, I'm 99.9% .9 corn my body, yeah. right? Like, born and raised. Like, I come from the land of corn. Like, I actually, you know, yes, I was born in Oaxaca. Like, I'm made of corn. But, I don't know, girl, for the past, ever since this blonde hair, Ever since the bleach got into my head, I've been fucking flour a lot lately. Um, there's two brands specifically. One, um, Caramelo, which you can find, which is from where? He introduced me. Arcus. From Lawrence, Kansas. Kansas. The best um, tortillas, like, honestly, in the, honestly, in the, in the, the planet. Honestly, the best like, flour tortillas, but also local Caramelo, but also local Mejorado, which is by, owned great. by the family who makes Puritos La Palma. Like, they're local. Their flour tortillas are bomb too. So like once like I had incredible flour tortillas, I was like, what? <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean like I feel like I'm just having like a moment in my life right now where I'm just embracing my LA and like I don't know, grabbing fucking a lot of flour lately. But corn. If like if my last meal, corn it is. Corn. And, car and Caramelo is doing a great job because um, you know we have a recipe you know, that's inspired by him for avocado. You know he has like uh, flour tortillas that are made with avocado oil. Um, so, you know, you're modernizing flour tortillas in a way that kind of keeps it with... But they're just, like, so razor thin, almost, yeah. like, see-through. I don't the know way how they he does it. They're insane. I don't know also how... Also, has duck fat they're... ones, you know, duck fat. So, it's like, if you have duck, you know, like, you, you can modernize Mexican food while still respecting it, it, its integrity yeah. and not, like, uh, you know, appreciating it and not appropriating it. I'm Blame it on the girl. bleach. I'm a corn girl for life. I'm 50-50, forever. Burritos, flour, but tacos and asadas corn forever. Go, I I'm a ride or die for corn. I, think, well, I know, but like, it, let me tell you how a caramelo I'm with a, a nice steak. It's like, there's nothing there's something and no about it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I bring caramelo tortillas almost everywhere I go. You know, my, my wife actually, well, I, I, I'm not lying. She, she has brought her own tortillas to, to like taquerias here in the street. <laughs> And she's like, and she's like, oh, like, can you use these instead? And, 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 and the taquero's like, what the hell? I've never seen anyone do this. So tortillas are a way of life. Um, <laughs> So find a tortilla that makes you happy. And, and I, I, I hands whether we're married. Out of time, but I know we, we you mentioned tortillas in your in your cookbook and the tortillas that we unfortunately are many times at the stores we shop at have been brutally just they're not tortillas anymore. So I think you know what we need to do as consumers is demand that they offer us real tortillas and real tortillas should only have three ingredients. So always turn out turn it around. And read it. What are the three ingredients? Flour. I mean, sorry, corn. Corn. <laughs> it's the bleach. No, no, but uh, but, but the but corn, like, water, corn, and water, lime. and lime. 
But, and uh, as a consumer, demand that those tortillas make way to your kitchens. You get rid of good, everything else. A good flour tortilla should also have just flour, water, and salt. Yeah. Really? Um, flour, okay, good to know. Flour, flour, water, salt, and fat. Some and kind fat. of fat. Yeah, so four. A manteca. Yeah. Or an olive oil. Or avocado, avocado, oil. Oil. avocado oil. Avocado oil, duck fat, avocado. like you can get fancy. manteca. It's not fancy, it's just a little bit pricier. Yeah, and that's a whole other panel, because that's like, you know, that's like NAFTA and like, and like you know, but it gets, it gets, it gets likely. <laughs> corn, you, you, can only t you can only talk about corn so much before it gets political, so that's just the reality. <laughs> Boy, that's like everything in life. No, no, but with corn, right, We're going to need to have corn. a whole other program, Kevin, yes. with just tortillas. Yeah. Yes. And Patty's going to be like all about it. Oh like, my God, I'll be the first one, I'll be the first one RSVPing. So let's. <laughs> I think it's Q&A time, right? Right, so we're gonna open it up to audience questions. Kevin with his black LA taco shirt's gonna uh, run around and- uh, I'm gonna he's, walk. Um, he's gonna walk, yeah. we don't want any accidents, yes. Exactly. So a question ends with a question mark, remember that? Not a period or exclamation point. <laughs> Kevin wrote that, so, so don't get mad. Props. Yeah, and don't be shy. We're all um, so please wait until no the takes one person. Kevin gets there with his the microphone. No and, questions. Uh, that way everyone can hear your lovely question. All right. Thanks. This weighs his hand really fast. Oh here. I have two questions. Can I ask oh. one? I mean, like all together. They're short questions. All right, if they're short. I've been <laughs> question marks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, charcoal propane. Ooh, charcoal. That's a great question. And what's your Mesquite. what's the uh, What's the utensil, kitchen utensil that's been in your family for such a long time? That, that it itself gives the food the flavor rather than the food. Amolcajete, charcoal, mesquite. Don't do propane. There's no, then if you're going to do propane, just use your stove. <laughs> Any other questions? There's one right here. All right. Save your, sk save your skin from the sun. Queridos amigos, celebro su éxito. Congratulations. Thank you. Javier, thank you for all your work. Thank you for being a collaborator and my ins inspiration to my son, Gabriel. Aww. I can't begin to thank you. Here's my question. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. Here's my question. Uh, so for many years, um, I was a professor and I taught a class called Food, Film, and Fiction at Whittier College. And I, I don't wanna go back to teaching again, but I would like to teach one more class where I would use your cookbooks. Oh. Because in my classes, we did a lot of recipes, but, but I never used cookbooks. His wife is like, question. <laughs> how, could I, how could I use your book as a textbook? There should be a class, an or entire just just class it. with this cookbook. Yeah. I, that's a question for your principal, I don't know. Thank you. They'd be having Thank bad you. bunny courses. It could yeah, be an asada it course. Yeah, could be an asada, asada and Oaxaca yeah. course for sure. How, I don't know, ask somebody. Here, that's not in this panel. You, you, like, ask a librarian. <laughs> <laughs> ask a librarian. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. That's so sweet. I, if if you do, let let us know. We'd love to come and have a talk too. All right, fine. I ran. Getting a workout over there. Hi, I'm Joseph. Um, Hi, Joseph. As millennial cook, um, we often don't have like, you know, we all live in apartments. What would you recommend? for a in-apartment asada grill yeah. for a stovetop. So I, um, I think, I, I'm sure I mentioned this in, in the recipes, but um, any meat, like especially like a flap that's very thin, put it on the broiler at 500 on the top rack, three minutes on each side, four minutes on each side, depending how preheat. Uh, the best thing is to do this, preheat like your sheet pan in there. So once the meat hits the sheet pan, it's already hot. So you get that sizzle on the bottom, put it in there, after four minutes, take it out, flip it over, put it back in there, and then you kind of get that same char. Because all you really want is that char. What right? about an air fryer? I don't own one. Nah, get out of here. Not an air fryer? <laughs> I, I mean, ask yeah, I, mean, the, ask I don't. the college kids. Yeah, I don't, I've never cooked in an air fryer before, but uh, broiler, the broiler. A uh, toaster oven works awesome. I mean, I tested a lot of the recipes in my toaster oven, remember? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I, 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 so I d did it both inside my house and outside, and I tested the recipes in like two different types of grills and inside, in my stove top, and then just also if you want to just get you know a nice hot like iron um, cast iron skillet, those work great as well. Um, yeah. yeah, just make sure you have a good vent because <laughs> the smoke. Yeah, if you if you don't if you, uh, I would definitely my advice is to like splurge on like a really good like Le Creuset kind of grill pan, like a super thick like cast iron. 
And just and if you want to get like really fancy, what about those little Japanese girls? I don't know, bro. Yeah, you can do that. No, but Inside? just like a, just like a good, just go to like the outlet, like Le Creuset and like uh, Cabazon Hills. I mean Cabazon or something, and just you know what? Large, large, like large twenty good. twenty ninety nine, like iron, like it's fine. Those are those are you don't search about the marketplace and face on Facebook Marketplace are always selling some Lodge Works cast iron Lodge Works. Find one on Facebook. It's twenty five dollars. You'll be fine. Uh, we're gonna take two more. One over here. Thank you. Uh, what publication would you recommend to keep up with a uh, modern Mexican cuisine? If you want to keep a, a day to day or week to modern week Mexican? understanding. Yeah, to modern Mexican cuisine. Or but multiple publications. What is like what publication do, uh, do we recommend to keep up with like modern Mexican cuisine? There aren't any. That's the reality. Um, you know, a bunch of publications have uh, have done like you know, magazines like you know. So food magazines obviously uh, are getting thinner, um, but you know they're they're trying harder now. Um, like the Michelin Guide. <laughs> no, <laughs> Michelin Guide. No, no, no. But I mean, uh, I know for a fact that Bon Appetit has done a lot of work to kind of undo the damage of uh, the, their editor in chief. A long time ago, so they're doing a lot better stuff now. Um, food and wine is great. Sever, food and wine, yeah. So the top three are still, are still up there, but mm -hmm. definitely, um, you know, it's, it's there's no like standalone kind of a publication in the, in the country that that is only dedicated to Mexican food. Interestingly enough. So. All right, we have one last question. Oh, uh, congratulations to all of you, to you too, Patty, on all your successes. Um, where do we get those tortillas, the caramelo and the Mejorado in LA. Is there an area in LA? Mejorado, you can get them directly in one of their shops. At, Sar at, so at Sarah's Market in, C in Cita Terrace. Oh, cool. Okay. Shout out to Cita Terrace. But you can also oh, order everything online. Okay. They yeah. Do you guys at Kansas? I was like, do they have to fly them in from Kansas? or do? Yeah, so, uh, so. Yeah, they get shipped to our home. <laughs> yeah, to both of our homes. Yeah. yeah. We, we, we order them on, like, online. Yeah, yeah. I order online. They get shipped to my he house. Also, he also just recently started uh, yeah, making insanely good like corn tortillas that like are just as good as flour tortillas, which Perfect. is crazy. We'll have so, to check out Sarah's. But there, there's a, don't get, there's a, don't get discouraged there is a wait list for, for the tortillas they're that good <laughs> they're that i'm telling you just but yeah but but uh, unless you're hobby you're not getting them <laughs> <laughs> but uh but Sar but sarah's market in city terrace is a great little tendita um not a bodega a tendita uh that uh that that, that has them always so yeah we're gonna stick around later if anybody has specific questions but um okay kevin's running here we go thank you all, all right. very much uh, hey let's give it up big hand thank yeah you. thank you <laughs> All right, um, so um, we're going to announce the winners, if you guys want to yeah, head to the back. So look at your wristbands. Each of them should have a number. Uh, we have 18 free books, so uh, you uh, if you are one of the, the winners, bit, though, so we can take a photo. Um, you, know, you can go out. There's a counter out there, and uh, just show them your winning number, and you can receive your book. So here are the winning numbers. Uh, there's 18 of them. Uh, so 43, 30. Uh, 111. Here, we're gonna, actually, I'm going to ask before, I'm sorry, Kevin, I'm going to go off script. Can everybody just kind of come together? I want to get a picture with everybody. Just like, don't be shy while the numbers are being listed. Can you guys yeah. come to the middle? I want a really beautiful photo of everyone for the Instagram. Thank you. But keep going with the, keep going. Oh, I don't know how Just sit down. Just go sit down. Wants. Just yeah. go and fill up all the empty spaces. Don't be shy. We're going to have a nice asada moment we're all, we're here. All family now. You keep going with the numbers, come on. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> Number 35. <laughs> so these are the winning numbers. 28. Huh? 53. Oh, really? Number four. Come on, everyone. Don't be shy. Come on, girls. Number 38. Okay. All right. We good? Yeah. Is it good? Is it good? <laughs> keep going with okay. the numbers. All it's right, fine. I don't know. This is multitasking, yo. Uh, Sorry, this is what I did. 21. <laughs> Number is 108. Number 56. Someone's holding a saddle book in there. That's cool. Uh, number 24. All right. Yeah. One more, one more. Uno, dos, tres. Uno, yeah. dos, tres. Asada, asada. <laughs> All right. Uh, number 84. Number 38. Number 72. Number 88, and then the last two is 
32 and 44. So if you have one of the winning numbers, uh, go out to the lobby. Uh, there will be free Asada samples out in the courtyard. Feel free to have those. Oh, cool. You're going to need to show your wristband, and then there's also book signing in the next courtyard. Right. Okay. So um, that concludes this program. Well, <laughs> yeah. Hold on. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin, I'm going to have to organize right, you better. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so please come back August 20th when we're hosting special musical performance. This will be, this will be a show coordinated by concert promoter Sid the Cat, and of course, it will be free. Um, until then, thank you so much again for joining us. The success of Alley Made and all of our library programs could not happen without the support of you and our amazing panel. So thank you so much. And don't forget to keep joining the summer reading. You have to August 5th. We have over a million readers. That's amazing for Los Angeles. So let's keep going. And we don't have, I don't think, that many more beautiful totes. But that's OK. We have reading and each other. So let's go. Let's yeah. make it, LA. Thank All you. Right, thank you.